frozen. <clears throat> you know what? The cold never bothered me anyway. Morning. morning. Praise God. Amen. So excited to be here. It's a beautiful day. A little cold for my taste, but the cold never bothered me anyway. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> uh, I talked this about. Uh, I talked about this on Wednesday night, but I want to talk about it again because I wanted to share it uh, with all of those who cannot be here on Wednesday. Uh, you know, I was watching TV earlier this week, and this show that I was watching, uh, this particular episode was about, was about a guy that was about to be executed for some crime. And the whole plot of the episode was that the guy that was playing the president of the United States and some of his staff were trying to find a way to make a decision to stay in execution, you know, but that it was a, an impartial decision. So several things happened during the episode and all that, and at one point, the president calls for a priest. And this is there in the Oval Office, they're having a conversation. And, uh, you know, during that conversation, they said something that uh, made me want to put this down and, and write some things. So this is what the, the this is how the conversation went. Uh, president sa says, I look for a way out. I really do. And the priest says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. You know what that means? God is the only one who gets to kill people. That was your way out. Did you pray? And he says, I did. I prayed for wisdom. And none came. It never has. And I'm a little mad about that. Once he said that, it made me think of... Uh, James chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. So then after the president says that, the priest says, you know, you remind me of the man that lived by the river. One day he hears on the radio uh, a report that the river's coming, and it's going to flood the town. It's going to take everything along its path. And all the residents in that area should evacuate. But the man says, I am religious. I pray. God loves me. God will save me. So the water starts to rise. And this guy comes in a rowboat and says, hey, you, town's flooding. Let me take you to safety. But the guy says, I am religious. I pray. God loves me. God will rescue me. The waters continue to rise. Then this helicopter comes around, hovering the area, and sees the guy. And they yell at him from the helicopter, hey, you, town's flooding. Let us take you to safety. And he says, God loves me. I'm religious. I pray he will rescue me. But then he drowns. So when he gets to heaven, he says, I demand an audience with God. So he gets to stand in front of the Lord. I says, Lord, I'm religious. I pray. I thought you loved me. Why did this happen? And the Lord said to him, I sent you a radio report, a helicopter, and a guy in a rowboat. What are you doing here? You know? So after the priest finishes that story, he looks at the president and says, you know what? He sent you a priest, a rabbi, and a Quaker. What more do you want from him? <laughs> so, after hearing that, you know, it made me think, sometimes we expect to hear this, uh, when, when we get an answer from, from God of what we've been asking for, we, we expect to hear, hear this uh, deep resounding voice, kind of like what happened when Jesus would, was baptized and came out of the water. But, in reality, he uses our own voices to tell us what we need to hear or to give us the answer to what we have been asking for. So, so when, we, when we ask the Lord for something, like in James 1, verses 5 and 6, we ask for wisdom, for example, we need to clear our minds of our own opinions 
and we need to trust and believe that we have received his answer and that it is the right one. In John chapter 8, it says, And the servant ab abideth, abideth not in the house forever, but the son abideth ever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but you seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. I speak that which I have seen my father, with my father, and ye do that which you have seen with your father. You know, we ask him for something. Typically, you know, us being humans, we, ha we, we have a, a preconceived idea in our minds of what we expect to hear. But when the Lord gives us the answer that we've been asking for, sometimes it's hard to listen mm -hmm. because it's not what we already have in our minds. Right. So it makes it hard for us to, to hear him. But he not only talks to us through using our own voice, he also talks to us through other people. And we need to be able to, to discern that so that we can understand and that we can learn to listen to him more and more clearly for what he's been trying to tell us. Uh, and to finish this, I, I saw this online a few days ago, and I want to read it to you because I think it applies. It says, when you find yourself in the position to help someone, be happy and feel blessed because God is answering that person's prayer through you. Remember, our purpose on earth is not to get lost in the dark, but to be a light to others so that they may find way through us. Amen. So, Amen. With that, Anyone have any testimony or prayer request? Okay, Jason. <coughs> look over our shoulders and live there, but I know we're supposed to learn from these things, how, uh, how things manifest and everything else. And it seemed to be a common thread that I saw. <coughs> Two things was hunger and prayer. God feed his people. If we <coughs> if they look to him, we, we, we ask for bread, he's not going to give you stone. Uh, and just in situations like that, and, uh, all the last few years, I, was, I believe during a time of pressing in, we have a heart for prayer or any prayer meeting at that point in time, <clears throat> just come if you could, just for a few minutes, or uh, we'll probably go for an hour and a half, two hours. Just, but in, in the midst of that time frame, if you have any needs, if you have any desires, or mostly if you have something from God's heart that you want to share, um, many of the testimonies and things that I've heard in the past for uh, uplifting His name and, and glorifying His name and furthering His kingdom. <clears throat> and that's the reason to gather. We gather for him, to worship him, to love on him, to further his kingdom. And that's the reason why we come. Mm -hmm. So don't think it's just about the worship team or anything else like that. It's not. It's about this body. And this body needs to function as a body. And I, I pray that y'all come and uh, just 
spend a little bit of time or the whole time or whatever as the Lord leads to engage in what God finds very unique. And it won't take all of us to do that because he wants his unity. And that's where I see a lot of the past revival and renewal and move of God from a total unity in the body. Yes, amen. Mark, do you want to say something?
stand. <clears throat> Let's thank the Lord this morning for all the things that he has given us. Father, we thank you for being in your presence today, Lord. Thank you for giving us your word, a word that is to lift us up, to teach us, Lord, to give us revelation, Father, of your promises, of our spirit, to have a relationship with you, Lord. Lord, we ask that you clear our minds of our own opinions so we can learn to hear you better, so we can understand what you are trying to tell us, what you have been trying to reveal to us, so we can continue to grow and help other people around us, Father. We thank you, Lord, for everything that you have done for us. We declare to those that are in need of healing, the healing is taking place right now. Those that Hallelujah, have a Lord. need is financial or relationship that needs mending, Lord, right now, we declare, Father, in Jesus' name, Hallelujah, Lord. that that restoration and that financial breakthrough has Jesus. taken place. We call Thank those Jesus. that are lost in the world, and those that the world Lord. has a hold over them, right now, we call them for you. They are coming to you. We want to bring us closer to you, Father, because we are your children. Next Friday, Easter Gate House of Prayer, 7 p.m. Uh, Mike, what are we going to focus on? Well, it's uh, like I've been talking about, getting this revelation of walking with God. And <coughs> we have over 300 songs in our repertoire to work from.
Bill Crowley announced and to speak the word. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? I am a believer, and these signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues, I lay hands on the sick, and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The eyes of my understanding being enlightened. And I am not conformed to this world, but am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord rebukes the devourer for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. And Abraham's blessings are mine. John and Donnie, would you mind taking the offering? Donnie, can you say the blessing? <laughs> Donnie, can you say the blessing, please? church let's worship the king of kings and the lord of lords because he alone is worthy
door. Thank you, Jesus, for opening the door. You are the door. Your arms are open wide, Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, Lord. Praise His 
praised his name, Jesus. Can't stop, praise his name. Can't stop, praise his name. Just can't stop, praise his name, Jesus. Can't stop, praise his name. Can't stop, praise his name. Just can't stop, praise his name, Jesus.
Jesus' name. I have overcome. I have overcome. I have overcome the world. Sing it if you believe it. I have overcome. Yes, I have. I have overcome. I have overcome the world. One more time. I have overcome. Yes, I have. I have overcome. I have overcome the world. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. love is here. His love is here. His love is here.
Let's praise him right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. John said, Behold the Lamb of God. takes away the sins of the world. Praise God. Hallelujah. Who has made us righteous with his righteousness. Whew. Praise God. Hallelujah. You know, the natural mind just can't get this, but every once in a while, just touches us in ways that goes beyond the mind, goes beyond thought, and just touches us in the deepest part of us, which is our spirit, and makes us so aware of his graciousness, his goodness, and his love, which is just, in the natural, unbelievable. It's, in the natural, too good to be true. But it's true. And it is good. Praise God. Let's give him a huge hand this morning. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God bless all of you for being here this morning. Thank you, worship team, Mike, as always. Thank you for being sensitive to the Holy Ghost. Praise God. Now, I was thinking, uh, the Sunday school kids, you can be dismissed. I, I was thinking that uh, the devil, when we try to, when we get into the flesh and try to fight the enemy uh, in the flesh, it's like, uh, it's like arguing with a fool because they pull you down to their level like the enemy does, get you into the flesh and then they defeat you with experience. <laughs> Praise the Lord. That's what will happen with arguing with a fool, and that's what will happen if you try to beat the devil at his own game. We have to operate by the Spirit, by the power of God. You know, we... Uh, what we've been talking about here recently and will continue to is that the real the real battle here is to is for us to operate from the spirit and uh, because that's where our victory is that's where the glory is that's where the revelation is that's where the power and the anointing and and all manifestation of God comes by the spirit we are spirits we have to remind ourselves of that all the time. That's who we are. That's what we are. We just happen to live in this thing. This is what we recognize when we look in the mirror, when we run into each other on the street. But God sees us as spirits. We were recreated spiritually. We were recreated in his image. God's image is spiritual. It's, it's a spirit. And so just by definition, we would realize then that anything that we uh, possess or receive, we receive by the Spirit. It doesn't, it doesn't come through the natural senses. You'll never get this intellectually. It'll, it'll never, you'll never be able to resolve this intellectually. This is exactly what Don was talking about. When we, when we have spiritual confrontations and battles, we're just being so foolish by approaching it from the intellect or from our senses. It just You can't win that way. It'll, it'll beat you every time. In fact, I, I heard somebody say, you know, oh, we t you take the Lord's name in vain. Well, you know, we have these, this right here gives the, the names of God, you know, Jehovah Jireh, uh, Jehovah Shalom, Jehovah Sidkenu, 
uh, and on and on. But those are not names that God gave himself. Those are the names that we gave him. And they really represent more of place and, and interventions than they do God himself. The only time God gave his name, he said, I am. Moses said, what am I supposed to tell him who sent me? He said, I am, that I am. And Jesus validated his deity when, when he said the same thing. Before Abraham was, I am. So how do you take the Lord's name in vain? When you say things like, I am sick. I am broke. I am dying. Right? We've received his name. And I understand the name that's above every name, Jesus. But in that name, Jesus himself declared, I am. I am healed. I am whole. I am prospered. Amen. I am victorious. I am more than a conqueror. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Praise God. Don and I was talking uh, earlier, and once we got off of our depressed state of the <laughs> current Hawkeye situation, praise the Lord, they're 2-0, and o, but God only knows how. But nevertheless, I digress. Um, I was telling him I just heard this the other day, and I think it's so, it's so true. You know, religiously speaking, we stand on the rock. You know, we, we stand on Jesus. And, but when Moses said, show me your glory, he was standing on the rock. But when God showed him his glory, he put him in the rock. Yeah. Yeah. That's where the manifestation comes, when we're in Christ. Yes. Not when we're standing on doctrines and, and theological debates and all of that and our religious stuff, which is, is, I'm not saying that's wrong, I'm just saying you don't get manifestation there. Religion doesn't ever produce spiritual realities. Only being in Christ can you see Christ. I mean, can you see the manifestation of what God does? So that's what we're talking about this morning is operating in the Spirit. Because the truth is, we never really have. I mean, I'm speaking of the church, quote unquote. Once in a while, we'll hit it. But the vast majority of the time, we've operated from sense knowledge. We've tried to reproduce things that have happened before through our own intellect and, and a lot of different ways. But religious people, uh, religion itself, and I don't mean this to sound you know, catty or snotty or snide or anything else, but are fools. And the more religious they are, the more foolish they are. Uh, you know, J Jesus, and I count myself in that number. I've been there. So, you know, I know a fool when I see one in the mirror. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. But um, Jesus talked to the Pharisees. They, these were the most religious people of his day. I mean, they crossed the T's, dotted the I's, did the everything right to the letter and he said that they were fools blind fools mm -hmm. he said they were blind guides man you know you don't want I, uh, you know blind people need guide dogs they don't need to be guiding the dog right. they need to be led right. but that's what he told them he said you know you're blind and you're leading other people as if you could see and you both end up in the ditch right. praise the lord in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, and this is what uh, uh, Jason was speaking about the other day, last Sunday, I believe it was, or two weeks ago, whenever. And uh, it was when Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, to reco the recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised to preach the acceptable year of the Lord or the year of God's acceptance. This is all about the spirit. Now the people he was preaching to didn't get it at all. In fact, it just made them angry. But in verse 21, he says the part that, that God spoke to Jason specifically to his situation. And that was, he began to say unto them, this day is this uh, scripture fulfilled in your ears. So he's saying, 
the time of the Spirit has come. The days of the religious activity are over. Because everything that I want to do for you, the opening of the blind eyes, he's talking about spiritual blindness, he's talking about spiritual uh, cripples, and, and so on and so forth. And, and in order to be healed physically, Jesus always dealt with the Spirit first. And we need to do the same thing. Because the senses have always been a traitor to the spirit. That's why God says the natural mind or the carnal mind is at enmity with God. It's a traitor to God. It, it, it won't agree with what God says. Your senses will argue with everything the Bible tells us. Your senses will tell you you're sick when God says you're healed. Your senses will tell you you're broke when God says everything you set your hands you prosper. This is all that we've been talking about here this morning. The senses are always hungry, but they're never satisfied because they they speak of an inner hunger that it doesn't that they don't the senses don't understand. I mean, it's why alcoholics are alcoholics. It's why drug addicts are drug addicts. It's why you know whatever. It's because of a hunger that can't be satisfied because it isn't a natural hunger, but the senses tell you that it is. Amen. It's always, senses are always seeking and never finding what they seek. We <clears throat> have to feed on the bread of heaven, the word of God, Amen. Jesus himself. He said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The only way to overcome your senses is to focus on what God has said in spite of what the senses are trying to tell you. Jesus put it a new way when he said, except you eat my body and drink my blood. And that's what I'll talk about this morning, but I just want to kind of preface it by uh, a, a few brief remarks here. See, blood, blood is life. We know that. Life is in the blood, the scripture even tells us. Blood is life. In this case, it's spirit life what Jesus is talking about, drink my blood. He's talking about the spirit. So we're to drink from that life. Praise the Lord. Amen. I'm talking about we need to live in the spirit life. Because just as has been spoken here this morning, the days of being carnal Christians are about to come to an end. You, you, being a carnal Christian is being a religious person. Uh, Jesus didn't come to create Christianity. You don't find Christianity anywhere in the Bible. The only thing you find in here is Ecclesiastes or Ecclesiastes, which is called out ones. People have been called out of the natural realm into the spirit realm. I, I'm not against Christianity, don't get me wrong, but that's something we just use. That's a, that's a language that we use, and we use it as though it were just another religion, and that's the, the, the negative part about it. We understand it's, it's Christ followers, but it takes on a whole other... Uh, dimension uh, when you start connecting it with the religious kind of activity uh, that most of us have experienced in quote unquote Christianity rather than the relationship which is a spiritual reality it's another realm amen when, when Jesus came along everybody lived in the realm of the senses when you read Matthew Mark Luke and John, you're going to notice that those people only had sense, knowledge, faith. Their faith was based on what they saw, what they heard, what they sensed, what they felt, you know, so forth. They believed what they could see, hear, and feel. The Spirit had no place in their everyday life. Now listen, I'm talking about a huge percentage of Christianity today. When you look at the disciples in those four Gospels, they only had sense knowledge. And that's why it was such a you know, mind blower when Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus said, Man didn't reveal this to you. I can't believe it because that's all I've been hearing from you folks. You know, God, your Father in heaven, revealed this. So it was a big deal because nobody was getting any kind of spiritual revelation or, or, or contact. It was all natural. It was all sense knowledge. Amen? So... They saw Jesus. They heard his voice. I mean, they saw the man. They heard his voice. They felt his hands on him when he'd pray or whatever. 
and, and they witnessed his miracles. Then they saw the arrest. Then they see the trial. Peter's saying, I don't know him. You know, the trial's going, I don't know nothing. I don't, I don't even know what you're talking about. And he begins to even curse. And then they see the crucifixion. Not one of them saw beyond the veil of his flesh. That's why he came on the road to Emmaus and has to talk to these guys. He said, what, what's the deal? He said, are you, are you, are you, have you not seen in the scriptures that this was to happen, that it was supposed to take place? Oh, we thought he was the one. They, they were operating strictly from their flesh, from their sense knowledge. Amen? And so in Galatians chapter 5, let's, let's look at that. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. And it's where, what G, where Paul is talking about here, again, is this I say, then walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. We always think of that, well, okay, let's, you know, going out and getting drunk or whatever. No, he's talking about if you walk in the spirit, you won't be dominated by your senses. Your flesh won't be telling you lies that are contrary to what the spirit of God has told you. Amen. So John uh, 16, verses 13 through 15. I'm just, I, I want us to have a kind of a uh, know where we're going here once I get to the text, but I, I want to kind of set this up a little bit. So how be it when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath are mine, therefore said I, that he shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. Now, when we got born again, it was a spiritual rebirth. It wasn't physical. Nothing happened to my body or my brain. What happened was I was born again after the likeness of God. My spirit was made perfect so that God could communicate to me by the Spirit, not by my intellect. My intellect has to be renewed to the Word of God so it doesn't fight my spirit all the time with arguments about what God is trying to tell me. And that's what Jesus is saying. When the Spirit of truth has come, he'll come and guide you into all truth. How does he do that? He does it by the Spirit. And he shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. The only way God is glorified is by the Spirit. He's going to make, in other words, he's going to make spiritual things as real to our spirits as physical things are real to our senses. Yes. Amen? Yes, sir. Now, for those of you that were here Wednesday night, you're hearing a little bit of a repeat, but I just going to want to get everybody on a level playing field here. Now, let's look at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 38. See, he wants the, the spirit realm to be as real to us as this natural realm has been. Sadly, it isn't, generally. The, spirit, the, the senses still dominate. But that's not what God saved us for, and that's what, not how he expects us to operate. The justified will live by faith. You can't do that unless you're operating by the spirit. Now, the just will live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Now, we always take that as, with a religious grain of salt as well, that if you don't do everything perfect, then God's going to abandon you. That's not what he's talking about here. Draw back from what? From walking in the spirit by faith. Now, if, if any man draws back from the walking in the spirit or being led by the spirit, my soul will have no pleasure in him. Draw, in other words, he's saying anybody who draws back into sense knowledge walk cannot connect with God. It isn't that God's abandoning you. It's just that you can't connect with God by the flesh. So if you draw back from the spirit walk that God has made possible for us, you're putting yourself at the mercy of the enemy. Because that's his territory. He's the God of this world, little g. This world is a sense world. That's why we get a body. If we're in, but we're in this world, we're just not of this world. We're supposed to operate by 
the world that we come from, the spirit realm. That's why he says we are ambassadors. Ambassadors don't subsist or exist on the place that they are ambassadors in. They are, everything that they have is, is provided by their home country, not the host country, their home country. That's why they could be in a third world country where people are eating beetles in the street and they're still having lobster and steak and champagne because their existence isn't based on the economy of the country they're in, it's based on the economy of the country they came from. That's why he says, I'll supply all your needs according to my riches in heaven. My needs aren't met by this world. My needs are met by God, who has far more than this world can ever provide. This is a third world country as far as heaven's concerned. In fact, it's worse than that. It's a poverty-stricken, crippled up mess in comparison to my home country. Praise the Lord. So if we don't draw back, if we draw back, we are operating in the flesh. If we don't draw back, that's how the human mind and body begin to lose their dominance and the spirit takes over if you don't draw back, if you don't fall back into this sense knowledge walk. Amen? And when we do that, the very thing that Jesus talked about in Luke happens. Exactly what he predicted, what he said is this scripture is fulfilled today. What? Blind eyes get open when you operate in the spirit. Yeah. Yeah. Amen? The lame begin to walk. The people that have been walking by their senses, limited, begin to walk by the spirit where there is no limitation. They're not lame anymore. They're walking in the power. Right? The mute. Those who couldn't speak all of a sudden prophesy. They literally speak with the voice of God. Yes. That's what he's trying to tell us. That's what he was trying to tell them. We are spirit beings. We have been born again. We are in the likeness of God after his image. We need to operate from that reality. Praise the Lord. So let's, look, let's, let's begin. John chapter 6, verses 53 through 54. And, we'll, and I want you to see, this was Jesus' message from the very beginning. The first time he preached in the synagogue, that was his message. Carnal is done, spirit has come. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man, and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh, and drinketh my blood, hath eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. Now, one thing Jesus was doing here was emphasizing the truth of salvation is by grace alone. And you'll see it the more we go on. It's by grace through faith. And he says this in a confrontation really with the Pharisees. There were other people there, but it was the Pharisees that were kind of trying to push things one way or another, and Jesus was trying to clarify some things. In the, in the whole sixth chapter of, of John, you see how the, all of the goodwill that had been generated by Jesus through all the miracles and the healings and the, everything that he had done is wiped out by anger and by outrage because of this message that he was preaching. The huge crowds, and if you look at this, the huge crowds that had followed him dwindled virtually to almost nothing just over a few verses. Four times in quick succession, he spoke of not only eating his flesh, but drinking his blood. And the symbolic meaning should have been obvious uh, of eating his flesh. He was the Messiah. It was, that's what he was trying to reveal to these, to these people that were there. He was the sacrificial lamb, amen, who would take away the sin of the world. But when he spoke of drinking his blood, they freaked because he was using language that was guaranteed. And he knew it. Believe me, he knew it. He's the one that spoke it originally. He was using language that was guaranteed to offend 
those Jews, especially the Pharisees. Because if you want to go back, we don't have to go there, but Leviticus chapter 17 is the whole story about blood. You don't ever, you, you, you don't eat strangled meat even you, because the blood's still in the animal. Blood is just a it's a no-no. You just don't touch it. And he's saying, drink mine. And they did not like the message. All right? All right, look at John chapter 6, uh, verse 26 and 27 back up here. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. So Jesus is wanting to talk to these people about spiritual things just like he still does. Why he gave us the Holy Spirit to lead us and to guide us into all truth. But these people were only interested in lunch. Something for their flesh. They needed a flesh picture. I said, uh, and, and uh, Roberto was talking about this morning. You know, we think Oh, somebody tells you, I, I heard the audible voice of God, or I saw this, or I experienced that, and we go, oh, oh wow, they're really spiritual. When in fact, it's just the opposite. God used that stuff under the old covenant because they had no spirit. They didn't have the spirit of God. He had to show them physical things. They had to see it, taste it, smell it, hear it, or they wouldn't believe it. But he's given us the spirit. So we have revival, and we make a big deal out of some what we think or declare to be a manifestation. And I'm not saying that God still doesn't sometimes uh, condescend to our humanity, but that's certainly the low level. He, he wants us to be led by the Spirit. And if you start depending on experiences, you're going to get disappointed, I promise you. Because He won't give you an experience every time. He'll give you His Word. He'll speak to you by the Spirit. He'll lead you by the Spirit. But he isn't going to just throw another free lunch out there for you every time you want one. He's trying to get you past that so that you can walk in the fullness of Christ. So that we can grow up into that position of walking just like Jesus did, led of the Spirit. Only doing what the Spirit tells me to do. Only, only uh, doing what he, I see the Spirit do. Only saying what I hear the Spirit say. Everything else is a mixture and it's going to get you in more trouble than, than it will ever uh, get you out of. Yeah. Amen? Amen? So th what they said was, they said, uh, we, we'd hear what you have to say if you'll give us something to eat. Amen. Praise the Lord. And, and to make it sound spiritual, we're, this is what we're good at, you know, as religious people. To make it sound spiritual, they said, verse 31. Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Dragging them right back into that old mindset. Amen? But Jesus continues to speak of a different kind of food from heaven. Amen? Amen? verses 32 and 33, where he's talking about true bread. He said, You're, you missed the whole symbolism. Now, this is exactly the point. He's saying, you guys don't get any of it. Because every bit of that was to point you to a spiritual truth. And you never figured it out. You're still trying to have the thing when the thing was pointing you to the reality of me. Right. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven. But my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. He's trying to give them the reality of that. But these people are so carnal. They're so sense-oriented. They can't get it. They're still looking for lunch. They're still trying to feed their physical appetites. Verse 34. Mm -hmm. 
Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So this back and forth, it, it makes for a, a frustrating study in misunderstanding and spiritual blindness. <laughs> In this last day, God's got to get us out of that place Amen. and into where we're going. Because if this is the acceptable day of the Lord, if we're going to see people healed, people delivered, people saved, we've got to operate by the Spirit. We can't keep doing this religious stuff thinking that it's going to produce anything other than more people standing around asking for fish and loaves. He's wanting us to be led by the Spirit so that He can do what only He can do. And then He'll be glorified and the world will be saved. Praise God. So this crowd, they're, they're demanding literal food. And Jesus is talking about something infinitely more important than a fish sandwich. Praise the Lord. But they wouldn't see it. Let's go back to verse 30. That's the whole point of this, this dialogue or this, this conversation that Jesus is having. Not about the feeding the, you know, the people with the fishes of the loaves, but the fact that this was all about getting people to understand things are changing. Yeah. We're moving out of that old religious way of doing things into a spirit realm where you're going to have to be led by the Spirit of God. They said, therefore, unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Mm -hmm. Got to have a vision. Got to have an audible voice. Got to have a something if we're going to believe you. What they were doing was offering to make a deal with Jesus. They'd believe on him if he'd agree to make food for him from now on whenever we ask. Now, that's what he was saying back in 34, and it comes back, and this is why. Look, we'll believe you if you'll continue to feed us whenever we ask for food. If you'll give us something natural, physical, whenever we ask for it. Praise God. Hey, I don't want to seem, again, just be a smart aleck, but that sounds to me like what we've called revival for the last 150 years. Jesus was there to talk to them about spiritual things. We want a cloud of glory over the platform. We want people to fall down. Now we want something that we can see. Keep giving us this and we'll believe it's you. Verse 35. Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. And then immediately they begin to murmur. <laughs> Sounds a lot like Christianity to me. <laughs> Verse 41 and 42, Sheila. Jews then murmured at him because he said, I'm the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? We know this guy. He came from Bethany. He didn't come from or Bethlehem. He didn't come from heaven. He came from that dirty little town down the road. He just meets their disapproval head on. And this is what I found out about God. He's not always seeker friendly. Sometimes he doesn't care if we like the way he does it or if we don't like the way he does it. He just does it. Verse, uh, let's look at 43 and then skip down to verse 48.
Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not amongst yourselves. Quit your whining, grumbling. Verse 48, I am that bread of life. Like it or lump it, believe it or don't believe it, I am the bread of life, period. You can grumble about it, you can complain about it, you can murmur about it, you can come reach your own decisions about it, but I am the bread of life. Amen. Now, it should have been obvious that he was talking about spiritual nourishment, about spiritual life. Verse, back up to verse 47, if you can, Sheila. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me hath everlasting life. He's speaking in spiritual terms, right? And the doctrine, uh, the doctrine of justification by faith was obvious in that statement. I'm the thing that's given, going to give you eternal life. He was given them the very heart of the gospel before he had been crucified, buried, and resurrected. Gospel truth was being revealed if they had spiritual ears to hear it. Praise the Lord. He even explains why the true bread of life is superior to Moses' bread, right? In, in uh, verse 49 and 50. And I think this will answer a, a question I've had a long time about how he didn't say things to certain people because he didn't want them to know. I think, wait a minute. You know, he was telling parables to his disciples to give them spiritual truth, but he had to do it in a way that was carnal because they couldn't get it spiritually. I mean here in a minute. Your fathers did eat man in the wilderness and they're dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. Praise the Lord. So it's, there's something going on here besides diet. Amen. Jesus was, he was explaining to them, and I think clearly, a profound spiritual reality. Amen. He's not describing literal food, amen, to be ingested through your mouth. John the Baptist, I, I said in, in the opening uh, that he had declared that Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amen. amen. Verse 51. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh which I will give for the life of the world. Now, he, I don't know how he could have made it any clearer what it was he was trying to get across to him. Yeah. So he's basically right here in verse 51, he's echoing the prophecy that John had prophesied when he saw him coming uh, down to where John was baptizing. Behold the Lamb of God. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Th these words are full of Passover imagery. I mean, and these are Jews that he's talking to. Pharisees, many of them, religious leaders. And this stuff is just packed full of, of the, uh, the image of, of this Passover feast. It shows you how carnal these people were. I'm not saying they weren't religious. I'm saying they had no spiritual understanding whatsoever. They were just going through the motions, doing what they did year after year after year after year without any spiritual discernment. Because here you've got Jesus trying to show them the relevance of the Passover in relationship to him. It was to reveal Christ as the fulfillment of everything that that sacrificial system signified. They wanted the sacrificial system, not what it was about, not what it was for. They wanted religion, not the relationship. It's just like, just like the, uh, the symbolic Passover lamb. It, it was a feast designed to be eaten. Christ is the true lamb. Amen. And it was a spiritual banquet 
prepared to be received by faith. Which was a concept like from another planet as far as these people were concerned. He was the fulfillment of everything the manna and the Passover feast symbolized. Everything. But they were so hung up in their religion, they couldn't get past it. They couldn't get to where that was to take them, which was a spiritual reality where they could be led by the Spirit, where they could have all of this and more. And I'm, I'm saying that's what I think the Holy Ghost is saying to the church today. Here I am, and you're still asking for a fish, you know, fillet a fish or something, you know. You're still asking for a sign. You're still asking for something. When I'm giving you the ability to do everything I did if you'll do it the only way I did it, which is by the Spirit. Yes. Yes. And we're still wanting sense knowledge religion. Right. And he's saying the only reason you ever had it in the first place was to bring you to a place of growth to where you could move into a spiritual reality, yes. where you could be led by the Spirit, where you could have everything that the Spirit has to offer. These people are incapable of thinking in anything other than literal terms. Now you say, we look back at this in hindsight, even with our limited spiritual, you know, walk. And I'm just speaking for myself. You may be far more spiritual than I am, but I know I'm not where I, where I want to be or where I should be, not because God's going to punish me if I'm not. I'm just losing out on what he's provided. But these people had, it was absolutely impossible for them to understand anything other than literal things. So when he begins to speak in these spiritual metaphors, they are still hearing this is about drinking his blood and eating his body. And all we're wanting is some fish. And is he just trying to be offensive? You know, is he just trying to irritate us? Verse 52, let's go back there again. The Jews therefore strove among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? I mean, now they're about to, they're pulling each other's hair. Well, how can I, what's, that, what's he talking about? I mean, how's he, gonna, how's he gonna get us to eat his flesh? What in the world kind of moron is this guy? What sicko? But I want you to notice something here. Jesus didn't stop him. He didn't, he didn't at that point say, no, no, you're, you're misunderstanding me. Let me explain what I mean. No, he just presses this metaphor even harder. Verse 53 through 56. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Who's, whoso eateth my flesh, now he's talking about the spirit. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, God life, spirit life. And I will raise him up the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. He's talking about God, the deity, the this Holy Spirit. Amen. He's not, he's not pulling any punches. He's not cons concerned about dumbing this down in some way. He's just telling it flat out like it is. And the clearer that Jesus makes it here, that he's talking about spiritual life, spiritual nourishment, the angrier these people get. The, the, the more hostile and the more offensive his words appear to be to them especially to these Jewish leaders who had set themselves up to be the, uh, the guardians of public piety, you know, and religious life. But finally, and this is, you know, amazing to me, even some of Jesus' own disciples began to whisper among themselves. 
verse 60. Many, therefore, of his disciples, when they had heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? In other words, I don't like the sound of that. <laughs> you know? Praise the Lord. And then he says, verse 61, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured out, he said unto them, does this offend you? Are you offended too, like these religious fanatics here? Verse 62 through 64. What if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was before? It is the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak to you, unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believe not. And this is the interesting part that I mentioned earlier. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. Praise God. He simply declares plainly, I'm using spiritual words to speak of spiritual things. He doesn't give them any exegesis or you know, explanation or clarification. Their failure to grasp his meaning was a fruit of their own disbelief. That they were strictly operating by sense knowledge. Praise the Lord. Verse 64, but there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning <coughs> who they were that believed not and who would betray him. Now look at that in, in, in light of John 2, verse 24. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. In other words, he knew it was a waste of time. He didn't tell him, I'm God in the flesh. Why? Because he knew they wouldn't believe him. So what's the point? Now, let me just add something from Nathan 101. You can take this for what it's worth, if anything. Sometimes... We think we're not hearing from God when we are. And sometimes we're not hearing from God because he knows you won't believe him. Now, the good news is we have the word so we can know what he says, whether I hear an audible voice or not. But how many times have we read it and thought, that's a hard saying. When I got this condition, that by his stripes I'm healed. We self-fulfill scripture. The, the word of God always has layers, always has depths and, uh, to the degree that you can believe. That's why the first time you read a scripture, you believed what was on the surface of it right? Praise the Lord. But over time, because your faith grows and your relationship with God grows, you can read that same scripture and all of a sudden you'll see a deeper truth that you didn't see before. Not that the other truth went away, it's just that now you can believe for more, so you receive more. This is the word of God. This is Jesus coming alive. You have not because you ask not. Or you ask amiss double-minded. You ask, not really believing that you'll get it, and then you blame God. Okay, you, you see what I'm trying to get to here? This is the whole point of this discourse. The whole reason for Jesus having this. He knew they weren't going to believe him, but he has it anyhow. Why? For them? No, for us. And not just so we could read a story of some foolish people 
but so that we can understand our dilemma is with our flesh. Our problem is not with God. Our problem is with our carnality. And I don't say carnality in the sense that we're evil, bad people, that God doesn't love us, because he does. He loves us and wants to dote on us and wants to give us all things and wants to bless us. But he can only do it by the Spirit. So we're, you know, then we get carnal or we operate from a natural mind, a sense knowledge, and it seems like God's cheating us or he's withholding us. Come on, why don't you just feed us all the time? Why don't you just, my name is Jimmy and I'll take all you gimme, you know? <laughs> and we're missing out on the fact that God wants to give us all things. But there's only one way we can get those all things, and that's by the Spirit. Praise the Lord. So that's the end of the discourse. It ends uh, actually with verse 65. Verse 65, still John 6, yeah. And he said, therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my father. Now that is powerful. And he's referring to the statement that he made back in verse 44. If you can go back there, Sheila. No man can come to me except the father which has sent me draw him and I will raise him up at that last day. Praise the Lord. Every believer receives the grace of God, which is, covers everything. It's by grace that we receive not only salvation, but everything that's a part of the inheritance. And we all receive it as a result of responding to the good news. The good news is the gospel of grace. Amen? Now, in John 6, verse 44... No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me. Draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Of course. <laughs> right? I mean, of course. The unsaved are dead. They're incapable of any spiritual activity. That's why Jesus wasn't worried about it. After all, he knew all men. He knows who will and who won't. So it wasn't like he was withholding it for some. He just knew that they weren't going to respond anyway, so what's the point? I don't have to give them uh, you know, an explanation for everything spiritual when I know that they're dead and they can't respond to spiritual truth. But I'm not going to withhold having said it. I'm going to say it anyway. I'm going to declare it anyway. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you know, how often I would have got, but you wouldn't. Why? Because you're spiritually dead. Amen? So they're incapable of any spiritual activity. I'm talking about people that are not born again. Until God quickens us. Amen? We have no capacity to respond to him, only to things. That's why a lot of religious people, they're not saved. I'm not saying... None of them. I'm just saying there are a lot of people that aren't saved because all they respond to is things. They don't respond to the spirit because they're either spiritually numb or dense or they're not even born again. Now, it's not, you know, I'm not, it's not my position to say who that is. It could be anybody. It could be everywhere, anywhere. But anywhere where people believe on Christ, there is a spiritual awakening, however small it may be. But the only way to move on with that is to operate by the Spirit. So as long as a person is spiritually dead, it doesn't do a whole lot of good to talk to them on a spiritual level. How many of you have found that to be true? You gotta talk to them like babies. You gotta talk to them about, in a natural way that they can relate to. And then believe that God will draw them by his spirit and quicken them so that they can then receive spiritual teaching and truth. Now, we don't know who they are, so, you know, we have to deal with everybody as the spirit leads us. Amen? Amen. 
So if you're operating as a result of, uh, you know, responding to things rather than to the spirit, what do you do? Well, you get more religious. You do more good deeds. You work harder. You put more effort into it. But nothing really happens. Nothing really changes. You know, does that make a sense to you? That's, that's what I'm saying. That's what happens even to people who are born again, who have the spirit of God. But they are they're not operating from the spirit. They're still operating from their senses. If you operate from your senses, you're, you always have to have something to motivate you or to cause you to do whatever it is you do because you're not being led by the spirit. So you just got to do a bunch of religious stuff and then call that being a Christian. This isn't about doing anything. It's about receiving. It's about believing and then being led by that same spirit that saved us yes. into all truth. Yes. I mean, here, here's a, it's all throughout the Bible, but even, even the prodigal son, this is pre-Christ incarnate, but nevertheless, it's showing you grace. It's showing you what Jesus is all about, the Father. He says as soon as he turned to go back to his father, as soon as he, in other words, as soon as he was going back to the spirit realm, back into the spirit realm, he said this, at my father's house, there's bread enough to spare. Bread enough and to spare. Now, he was hungry. He was wanting to be fed. He said, I'm sick of eating this crap, you know, this hog, you know, corn husk or whatever it was. But the minute he turned back to his father, he realized, in my father's house, in the presence of God, there's more. There's bread and that to spare. Amen. Now, another way that the scripture says that is, is God says, um, I'm going to give you the divine, by these precious promises, you're going to receive the divine nature of God. Spirit, in other words, you'll be able to operate by the spirit. And if you'll seek that, that spirit, the, 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 the kingdom, you'll, if you'll seek his kingdom, that's the spirit realm, all these things will be added. Right. See, if we'll, if we'll operate by the spirit, you don't need him to give you a fish sandwich every day. It's like the old cliche, uh, feed a man a fish and you fed him for a day. Teach him to fish and he'll feed himself for the rest of his life. Right. Well, that's kind of a different twist, but that's God's way of doing things. He doesn't want to just give us a fish. He wants to give us our daily bread so that we, we're, we're fed every day. Amen. And it happens by the Spirit, not by me, you know, trying to rationalize, trying to figure it all out, trying to do enough to feel like God will then give me my lunch. Amen. I've earned it today. Amen. No, he just wants to give it to me because he's already done everything necessary for me to receive it. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Okay, let's, uh, a couple more scriptures here and we'll quit. Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. Now remember, dead people don't get it. They're, I mean, people that have no spirit don't understand spiritual things. And none of us would have if the spirit didn't draw us originally. So therefore, we are buried with him by baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. What's the newness of life? The life that Christ walked in after the resurrection, which was a total spirit life. Now, yes, he did have a, but he had a spiritual body. No longer subject to the flesh. This spirit body fits the spirit. It agrees with the spirit. It doesn't operate by the senses. It operates by the spirit. And that's what he's telling us. This new life that we've received, that's the ultimate goal in this new life is to live by that new life, to live by the spirit life. He didn't give us another 
50 years of age, you know, or another 75. He didn't give us another flesh life. He gave us eternal life, God life. And that's the life we're supposed to walk in. That's a spirit life. Because it's in that spirit life that all things are added to us. Praise the Lord. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, verse 10 through 16. I'm a little afternoon here, but I'll, I'll quickly finish here. All right. So, so God, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of a man, which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. You see, it happens by the spirit. The world operates in a sense knowledge spirit, a dead spirit in terms of God. It's only, it, it, its faith is based on its senses, period. But that's not the spirit we've got. We, we've been born again and we now have the spirit of God and it's by that spirit that we know the things that are freely given to us by God. Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Amen. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. So that's good news because the natural person can say whatever they want to about me, but they can't judge. Don't judge me. <laughs> you ever hear that? My granddaughter loves to say that. Don't judge me. <laughs> Praise God. But I can judge all things. Why? Because it's by the Spirit. If I'm doing it by the Spirit, I can't judge everything by just what it looks like. And, you know, you know, because I, I can be as carnal as anybody else can. Right? But we have the capacity to discern and judge things by the Spirit. Praise the Lord. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. <laughs> Remember Job? God said to Job, when Job started asking questions like that, because he didn't have the Spirit, God said, well, where were you when I hung the north on nothing? You want to give me advice? But he tells us, who hath known the mind of the Lord that we might instruct him? We've got the mind of Christ. In other words, we don't need to try to tell God what to do. We ought to know what God's doing and how he does it. Instead of saying, I don't like the way you handled that. Pretty good idea you're in the carnal mind because you're not discerning. You're just looking at natural, physical, and saying, where's the fish sandwich? Come on. Right? 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4. I'm, you know, I'm being facetious in a lot of ways, but I'm, I'm saying, look, look, this is serious stuff. God wants us to operate by the Spirit because the only way we have any power, the only way we have any uh, ability to, to control situations and circumstances or to change environments or to minister where, where, where everything is telling you sickness, disease, and death, you can't change it with sympathy. You can't change it with empathy. You can't change it with compassion. You can't change it by volunteering at the hospital, although all those things are good. Right. You'll only change it by the power of the Spirit, by operating from that reality, from our inheritance, that whatever we set our hand to prospers. Amen. By His stripes we're healed. We cast out demons of sickness and disease. Amen. Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption or the sense, amen, realm that's in the world through the flesh. So we're given these, these promises that by those promises we can be, we can operate the way God operates. Spirit, the divine nature. And escape the confines and, and the, uh, Jesus called it in, in, in Luke, 
the bondage or captivity of the senses. Praise the Lord. All right, Romans 8, this last scripture. Romans 8, uh, verses 26 through 32. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray. This is a conversation Don and I were having just before church. And we've all had it, at least with ourselves, if not with somebody else. I don't know what we're supposed to be praying. Our infirmities are not necessarily sickness. It's our limitations, our, our, limit, our, our natural thinking. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself makes intercession with us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose, to be spirit beings, new creation, new creation. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. A spirit being in a body. Amen. So that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Praise the Lord. There's your lunch. Praise the Lord. All things that pertain to life and godliness. Eat his flesh. Drink his blood. Amen. In other words, your strength is from his life. Praise the Lord. Your, your power, your anointing is from his blood, the spirit. Eat his flesh, drink his blood. You'll have your lunch. Amen. And he'll pop the bag. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. You, you You'll always have what you need for every situation. That's why he said, you know, when you're called before uh, these hierarchies, I believe he's speaking of demonic forces, principalities, powers, high places. He's not talking about natural people, although that could be. Uh, I think the, the, the greater truth is that when you're called before in other words, when you're faced with a demon of sickness and disease, when you're faced with a demon of poverty and ignorance, don't think about what you're going to say. Don't try to figure it out carnally, rationally, naturally. For your Father will give you what you need to say. He'll, the Holy Spirit will speak to that situation exactly what needs to be said so that that demon hears God's voice not yours and he will plead seven ways believe me he's not going to stay and argue with God Don said another I'll just repeat this as well when those demons come after the sons of Seba, you know tore their clothes off of them left them naked in the street these were guys trying to operate in the Holy Spirit without the Holy Spirit and uh, the, the demon said Paul we know and Jesus we know but who are you and then they tore him up if we operate by the spirit it's as though Jesus is speaking it's as though God is speaking right out of our mouth and they know it the demons know it but they know when we're in the flesh and they'll rip you up seven ways to Sunday praise the Lord they'll strip you and leave you naked looking like an idiot but if you let God speak back off. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. People will be healed. Yes. Amen. Lives will be transformed. Mm -hmm. And God will be glorified because we'll know and they'll know it wasn't us. It wasn't the flesh that accomplished this. This was something God did. Amen. Amen. Let's give him a hand clap. Praise God. Amen. 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 So let's go out and just be what we are. Praise the Lord. Spirits. Anointed. Powerful. Amen in Christ. Glory to God. God bless you. You're dismissed. Have a great week. Hope to see you back here Wednesday. Come Friday if it's all possible. For a little while or a long while. Just come and be part of it. Praise the Lord.